The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast. Bringing you strange but true things from the past. It's not the average history that you learned in school. We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools. Them stories that are just too crazy to believe. The stranger than fiction and super unique. Julia Cook, welcome to Can't Make This Up. Hi. Hi, how are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very good. Thank you for coming on to talk to us uh, about your uh, new book coming out in March, uh, Come Fly the World, the Jet Age Story of the Women of Pan Am. Uh, for starters, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself? I understand you're a, a full-time writer. You've written on a lot of international uh, topics. Yeah, um, I started my my career in writing and um, as a journalist, a freelance journalist in Mexico City, just out of college. Um, so that that kind of uh, I began internationally and just kept going. Um, I moved back to the U.S. after four years in Mexico City and then one year in Cuba. Um, Havana was the subject of my first book, which was about youth culture uh, in Havana. Uh, as at the changing of an era, um, as Fidel handed over the reins of power to his younger brother Raul, and everyone was um, really wondering what would happen next. Um, so I moved back to the U.S. after that um, and uh, wound up doing more uh, travel writing, writing about art and architecture, um, essays as well, uh, some cultural criticism type pieces. Uh, so my writing's really been all over the place. Yeah, uh, in looking up your your bio, um, I guess the more appropriate question is, is there anywhere where you haven't been published? <laughs> yeah, it, it's really interesting because I've been published in a lot of the more mainstream journalism um, venues. I've done some travel writing for like the Wall Street Journal and um, Condé Nast Traveler and uh, that sort of mainstream travel, travel venues. Uh, and then I've also done some more, um, you know, reflective pieces for more literary type magazines, um, which is just really fun. You know, it's really fun to me to toggle between the two modes. All right, so you became interested in writing about uh, Pan Am uh, and, and the women that worked for Pan Am as stewardesses. Uh, what prompted you to, to decide to write a book about this? You know, it was really, um, it, it came out of, I guess in a way, what had been my interest what's been my lifelong interest in art and architecture, which I've also written about a fair amount. Um, it was a very roundabout sort of way to approach um, the subject for this book. Uh, I, I went to um, an event at the TWA terminal, which was designed by Eero Saarinen. Uh, the old TWA terminal at JFK is a beautiful, beautiful piece of architecture that I'd always wanted to tour. Um, and so, you know, when I, saw about six or seven years ago that there that the Pan Am Historical Foundation was going to host an event there. Um, I went. Now my father had used to work for Pan Am. He worked for the airline until I was nine, um, which is how I knew about the Pan Am Historical Foundation. Um, and when I went to the event, uh, it was, you know, of course I toured the building and it was gorgeous. It's now a hotel. So in non-COVID times, people can tour it themselves. Um, and I think everyone would agree with me that it's an absolute stunner. Um, I wound up talking to these two former stewardesses for Pan Am for most of the event. And I just, um, I really loved them. I had a great time talking to them. I was so impressed with their attitude, um, their knowledge base, the way that they talked about the world. They talked about events of history with such profound knowledge and intimacy, um, and also in a really fun way, as if they'd kind of had martinis with the prime minister the day before, or, um, you know, hobnobbed with the spies <laughs> and um, celebrities that were doing all of these crazy things in the 60s and 70s. And I just really wanted to know um, how they had acquired these attitudes that made them talk about the world as if they owned it. If you could take us back to the early days of commercial aviation, uh, you know, what, what was it like and, and how, you know, cause I, 
you've obviously flown quite a bit, I'm sure. Um, you know, I'm sure many listeners have, have done a fair amount of flying. How does flying compare then versus today? It's not really, um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, it's not comparable because then traveling was such a rarity, uh, traveling by air, you know, and I guess it depends on what, which then we're talking about. If we're talking about the 20s, 30s and 40s, when air travel itself was brand new, um, you know, it, it was a little more dangerous. It was also certainly a lot less comfortable um, before jet planes um, or before, you know, in that very early era, um, mm -hmm. some planes flew below the um, the cloud line. And so there was a lot of turbulence and um, there was a lot of, it, it was, it was very uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, as the technology improved and as the flight routes expanded and, um, you know, as the, the speed and ease of travel improved uh, into the forties, fifties, um, and then sixties, uh, as the jet planes emerged, which that was 58. So, um, you know, first planes were flying in the weather, below the weather, and then they were flying above the weather, but via propellers, and then the jets um, emerged. And so, you know, in the era of the jet plane, which was 58 onward, um, the government, the US government set the pricing uh, for American airline corporations uh, by flight miles um, and destinations, not by, not so the airlines couldn't make up whatever fare they wanted to in order to compete with each other. So this meant that what they competed with was the airline experience. Um, so the perks really varied by airline. Um, some one airline <laughs> rolled out a literal gold carpet across the tarmac um, and kind of tried to make passengers feel like they were just just as um, you know important as the celebrities that boarded their planes. Um, other airlines focused more on um, food. Uh, they all focused on uh, the stewardesses. They all treated the stewardesses as if, you know, they were another perk and whether that was um, via their uniforms, uh, their uniforms varied from the very professional to the really um, quite racy over the course of the 60s, um, or whether it was via uh, the kind of women that they hired, uh, everyone, you know, that everyone agreed that a stewardess was an important aspect of the in-flight experience. And everyone also agreed that it, it should be, that in-flight um, service should be uh, women, performed by women. Uh, so that's, that's what this book, my book uh, really examines uh, a lot of how this job that really was, came from some pretty sexist bases, um, wound up actually offering a lot of the women who performed it a whole lot of freedom. Uh, that seems a far cry from today when the perk is you get a little, a couple extra inches of knee room. Yeah, <laughs> or those really yummy cookies. <laughs> yes, right. Um, so, um, you know, the, the airline you focus on specifically is Pan American. Um, how did they sell the prospect of being a stewardess to young women and, and, and what kind of women were they looking to hire? You know, they didn't really need to work that hard to sell it. Um, if you think about, uh, I, I, it's hard sometimes to remember from the vantage point of today um, or not even remember to, to conjure in the imagination from where we stand today, uh, the amount of constraints that existed around women's movement in the 40s and 50s in particular. Um, it was really not societally acceptable for um, a young woman to travel alone without a chaperone, um, just wherever she wanted to go. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the, the thing was, airlines never really had to work hard to attract women to apply to be stewardesses because being a stewardess was this kind of golden ticket um, in a way to, to being able to travel by yourself with the approval of society um, and without having to forfeit uh, your belonging in this kind of accepted feminine role. Um, you didn't have to be uh, an iconoclast or a contrarian who was determined to forge her own way um, in order to uh, be a stewardess and travel around the world by yourself and get paid for it. And I, I assume for, you know, uh, 
you know, most women, you know, perhaps living in a small town or something like that, where their their prospects of ever leaving that far from home, this really called out to them. Totally. You know, there's a really interesting book by um, Virginia Postrel uh, called Glamour, and it's all about the the ways that uh, glamour what, what glamour does in society and, and how it is projected through the media. Um, and one of the things, it was one of the first books that I read as I was thinking about this, um, this era and air travel and writing about these women. And she really lays out exactly why and how um, internationalism became so glamorous in the immediate post-World War II period. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of social, political um, factors that were that were all converging. And basically the, the takeaway was that in the um, 50s and early 60s, you know, just, just getting out of the country was this incredibly um, glamorous, exciting prospect, in part because it was newly accessible to many more people. But at the same time, it was still, um, unlike today, much more of a once in a lifetime type of um, goal. Now, for the, the women who applied and were accepted, uh, you know, what, what training did they go through? What, what did it mean for them to be a stewardess? The training was pretty rigorous and really interesting in a lot of ways um, because it really exemplified the two extremes of the job uh, of, you know, real grit and glamour. Um, on the one hand, so it was, for Pan Am at least, it was six weeks at their Miami training school. Um, and each of those weeks had kind of a different focus. Uh, and what I found so interesting about it as I was looking at what they did and I, you know, I read training manuals and um, looked at the, the quizzes that they, they got, uh, it, the, the dichotomy was so vast and it's so interesting to look at. They were tested on things um, like how to prepare a good highball in the right, you know, wh what's the order in which you put things into a highball glass as you're making a cocktail for someone. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, they were tested on, you know, what, what are the, the forces, the, uh, the physical forces um, that are working on an airplane as it's moving through the air? And what are the names of, what's the difference between, uh, you know, the yaw and the, uh, the pitch and the, like, I, I, I honestly, I forget. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, these very detailed questions of physics. Um, so these women were, you know, they also, they spent a week on grooming, figuring out, you know, the proper posture and what are the best colors for your eyeshadow given your skin tone and your hair color. Um, uh, and then at the same time, they were, you know, the, the, the training school had a, a ditching pool. So they would practice jumping out of um, a plane's fuselage uh, to, to get into the pool for a water landing. Um, and they were tested on the speed at which they could all, they could get um, a group of people out of the plane. And uh, so, you know, you, you had these two real extremes. On the one hand, it was incredibly superficial. And on the other hand, it was real. That is a really interesting dichotomy between, you know, the, the aesthetics of, of their job and, and the hospitality part, but then the actual public safety. Completely. They, they were, you know, they, they were... Um, in the words of today, they were really first responders in a lot of ways. And, and a lot of the women who um, wound up being on planes that were hijacked in the golden era of hijacking or that wound up getting into uh, terrible accidents, they wound up having to do the worst um, the worst possible things, right? Mm -hmm. One Pan Am stewardess in the 80s, I mean, and this is an extreme case, but a stewardess named Nirja um, wound up giving her life to, when a terrorist boarded her plane uh, and she, she was shot protecting her passengers. So, you know, these, um, these dangers were real and the women had to know how to handle almost any eventuality and think on their feet and um, be really prepared how to keep a keen eye observing um, who was doing what on a plane and what the machinery was telling them if they needed to tell the um, captain anything important that there was any a mechanical failure in any way. Um, they were really alert to all of these really extreme circumstances. And at the same time, they really had to project this kind of unstudied glamour and ease and um, feminine allure. Now, um, you, know, you mentioned extreme circumstances. Um, 
you know, one thing that was interesting is is this whole story of of the Pan Am and the Jet Age is, is occurring in the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Um, how did how did that war affect the airline and the stewardesses? Um, and and I guess we should really ask, you know, how did how did they affect the war? It's a great question. Um, you know, the war. So so if you to back up and speak in a more macro general um, way about your question, it it surprised me how surprised I was in a way that um, that airline stewardesses or, or Pan Am passenger planes. And, you know, Pan Am was not the only airline to contribute to the war effort. A lot of different American airlines also flew um, soldiers out to war. But it, it had surprised me when I learned that these um, passenger planes were ferrying troops into active war. In I, I was also completely surprised when I read that. But, but when you think about it, it, there's the Pacific, the Pacific Ocean is enormous. How else are they going to get out there? We're talking about massive numbers of troops. Um, you know, up to 500,000 men in the country. So how else are they going to get out there? You know, like I, when I found out about it, I was like, oh, wait, that's, of course, of course they went out on, of course the government contracted with civilian airlines because they had um, the, the big fleets and they could move people quickly. Um, and they had the, you know, infrastructure and the organization to handle things, um, you know, in, in a, easily managed way. So, you know, we don't think about what that means. Um, if, you know, if you and I are an example, <laughs> um, it, I think the few people would have thought about what that means for flight crews themselves. So, you know, in, in reality, a lot of the women were pretty surprised as well. Um, a lot of the women who had signed up to fly on Pan Am at least had really done it thinking about um, you know, Rome or Timbuktu or the Mayan pyramids. They, the, these were what they were trying to get to um, in a way. They were not necessarily thinking about uh, <laughs> flying into a war zone or being asked to ferry troops, um, men who were really frightened to be heading into war um, or really scarred from leaving. Uh, so in reality, it impacted a lot of them in a lot of different ways, but um, the one really, com there were some commonalities that a lot of them talked about, the women uh, that I interviewed, they talked about how flying um, men into war was really a, a, a scary and sad and solemn experience for basically everyone on the plane. Um, and the stewardesses all felt very keenly their duty to kind of try to lift spirits or just be there for, for the men to lend a listening ear if anyone wanted to talk or um, just be an open and warm and kind um, human being to men who were very frightened, um, even if they disagreed very vehemently with the war itself, they were very aware that the human beings who were um, going to fight it many of them didn't want to be there um, either. So they, they really wanted to impart what human dignity they could in a really awful circumstance. Um, and then they all agreed that leaving the, uh, leaving the combat zone was an incredibly festive um, and really relieved flight to be on. What startled me about just reading about these flights, I couldn't stop thinking oftentimes about just the sheer youth of them when you think about um, you know, a plane full of young men who've been recently drafted um, heading into war. And then the women who are serving them are all for the most part in the late sixties, at least in their early twenties. Um, just the sheer youth of that, that plane would have been staggering. Yeah. And you, you juxtapose, it, um, um, juxtapose that with the, you know, the enormity of what they're doing and the, the, the very hev the heaviness of it. Totally. It, it, and the heaviness of, of what the women were, you know, the men, we're, we're accustomed to thinking about the heaviness of um, what we're asking drafted soldiers in particular to be doing. Um, and, you know, there's a reason why we moved away from the draft um, after that war. Uh, but we don't think about <laughs> the fact that a lot of these, these stewardesses were not necessarily trained for war zones. They were trained for a lot of different, um, you know, uh, combat-like 
area, re regions of instability, shall we say. Um, but they were not trained to be flying in and out of um, Da Nang necessarily. Uh, and they were not trained to um, be, you know, looking out the window to see uh, if they were, if there was any enemy fire below or proximal to them, or they were not necessarily trained for a lot of the things that they were um, eventually sometimes asked to do. Or offer psychological support to men returning. Totally. To well, or, or, you know, there was an era in which um, the, the army had a big drug problem in Vietnam. And so, you know, some of the women had to deal with uh, collecting drugs from the men in order to uh, trying to convince them to give them their drugs because they didn't want the men to get into trouble uh, with customs or and the police uh, when they landed in the US. Uh, they had to deal with men coming down from drug uh, experiences. And they had to deal with a lot that they weren't necessarily um, trained to do. And the fact that a lot of them didn't quit, they just kept going. They, they really wanted to um, do what they could to, to help um, these men, it, it was a real testament to their um, fortitude and, and, you know, their own grit. Now, um, you know, we've talked in very, you know, broad terms, but, but who were some of the people you talked to for this book? Um, you know, who were some of the individuals that you, that you chose to highlight? Um, I chose to highlight a group of really remarkable women uh, who were all really, really generous with their time and really open with their experiences um, to me. I, I talked to a lot of women, many, many dozens of women um, in general for, for the book. I talked to um, soldiers also. I talked to uh, people who'd worked for the airline in different departments. But the women that I focused on um, had a couple of things in common. Uh, almost all of them had flown um, on war flights. Uh, all of them had worked for the airline for a fair, a, a good period of time. Um, and they were all in it for different reasons. That, that I found really important. I wanted to um, highlight a diversity of uh, voices and then show how working um, as a stewardess in the 60s and 70s satisfied a lot of different uh, goals for a lot of different women. So, you know, they, uh, the women that I wound up finding really varied. Carrie, Karen um, Walker was is more of a romantic. She was really um, interested in traveling. She was very wanderlusty. She tended to spend time on her own when she was uh, on layovers. She really loved to just walk through cities um, and see what she could see and talk to people and pop in and out of shops and eat. Um, and you know, then there was Tori Werner, who was much more of a, um, an extrovert. Uh, she also equally invested in the travel, but, you know, she really loved to um, do things with her crews. She formed a really vast network of friendships um, all over the world, but also with the women that she flew with. Um, so she really uh, represented really well what I saw to be uh, an incredible camaraderie that was formed among these women. Um, and then there's Lynn Rawling, who um, is more of an intellectual in a way. Um, she had studied science in college and had been really um, disheartened to, to see that indulging in her more intellectual leanings would not give her a job that she could um, also be an extrovert in because she's also really she's she's a she's a um, she's a very extroverted very warm person who you know you can just tell when you meet her she thrives on um, helping people so it was it was you know after she graduated with a degree in a science degree she uh, decided that she couldn't work in a lab <laughs> um, it was just too too lonely for her um, she wasn't sure what she wanted to do but she uh, had spent a summer in Rome and absolutely loved it, loved seeing the way that different people lived in the world and loved um, everything about traveling. So she decided she'd take a couple of years and um, work as a stewardess. And those couple of years stretched on a fair bit longer once she realized that um, she could kind of, she could be a bit of an anthropologist on her planes. <laughs> 
how cool for you because most of the guests that i interview uh for this show um you know are dealing with older historical topics and you know we're talking about archives or maybe uh, other uh, um audiovisual documentation, things like that. But you actually get to uh, sit down and have a conversation with your subject. Yeah, it was really cool. And you know, the really cool, the coolest part about it was actually seeing the way that these conversations that I was having with people, I would then go to the archives or, you know, go to the um, old newspapers and see that, that what they were telling me about had actually been written up in, in very different ways in newspapers or you know I, I would have an interview with someone and they would tell me about something that I could barely believe like a, a kidnapping or some such mm -hmm. um, and then I would I would say wait hang on this has to be that this is crazy this can't be she must be misremembering it in some way and then I would go to the archives um, or read a newspaper book or an academic account of exactly the same event and see that in reality <laughs> her memory had not been lying um, <laughs> the the circumstances that you know what had happened actually was just as um, vivid as, as she described it. And so that, that was what was really exciting, going back and forth between these interviews and the more traditional historical research was just, it was exhilarating. Right, and adds a, a you know, such a, a more personal element to the, to the story, being able to see these, you know, first person perspectives. Because if you had a question about something, you just, just ask. <laughs> exactly, I, I remember calling, um, calling one of my interview subjects while I was driving somewhere because something had just occurred to me as I was thinking over a scene and I just called her and and I was like hang on let me put the recorder on so that I can we can just talk this through but then I can go back and look at it when I sit down later but I just had to ask you this one question and um you know in just a 10 minute phone conversation we uh I got incredible texture for a scene that I later would um write up for the book um so one theme that is reoccurring throughout the book is um, the theme of discrimination that, that these women face. Um, you know, what, what kinds of things did, did they have to deal with? And, and, you know, this again, you know, speaking macro again, this is occurring in the backdrop of the push for women's equality and women's rights in, in the 60s and 70s. Um, how did that play out in the air? Uh, it, yeah, it, it played out in a lot of different ways and on a lot of different levels. Um, you know, it, it, Lynn, uh, the, the, the science major has a great moment when she, um, she's in, on a plane and she's sitting down reading her subscription to Scientific American, her most recent Scientific American. And, you know, a, a gentleman in first class leans over and says to her, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't someone like you be better off reading Vogue? And she, you know, a testament to her equanimity, um, was just very calm and smiled and said, no, I, I you know, I, this is what I studied in college and, you know, explained to him a little bit about her background and who she was. And then she turned around and pointed out every one of the women in the crew and said, you know, she majored in this and she went to this school and, you know, before working on a plane, this woman worked for NATO and, you know, um, that's who the women who are crewing your flight are. And this man, I, I can only imagine that he was kind of floored because, um, you know, as he was getting off the plane, he kind of stopped her and he said, you know, my daughter had said that she wanted to be a stewardess and I told her there was no way that I was gonna let her do that or give that the okay. And, um, you know, I, I think I might be wrong. I, I think maybe maybe she could do this and, and she would really get a lot out of it. And, um, you know, of course I'm paraphrasing both of what, what they said, and there's mm -hmm. a much more um, concise version of that conversation in the book. But uh, that, that, that was what they faced a lot of. Um, and, you know, some, sometimes it was more aggressive. Sometimes they faced uh, clients who, or customers who, you know, were, were really convinced that because stewardesses had this um, reputation as being um, you know, slightly more, less substantial, shall we say, um, that, that that meant that they had a right to kind of ask them out or even be more aggressive, uh, touch them, uh, et cetera. Uh, so some women had to deal with that. Um, other women just had to deal with what we today would call kind of microaggressions. Um, mm -hmm. But 
but you know they all handled it in very different ways and for some women it, it wound up being too much and and the the um the equation you know it, they didn't get enough for that kind of treatment necessarily so a lot of women not 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 a lot some women did quit uh and and move on to a different job uh with slightly less um, discrimination but but a lot of the women really you know uh chose to keep going and they really changed the job uh because they wanted to they wound up fighting again back against uh whether it was that that minor discrimination type stuff uh, along the lines of what Lynn experienced, or whether it was um, discrimination on the level on a corporate level, which they also faced, because in the early '60s the requirements for the job, women were required to quit if they got married or they could be fired. Um, they were required to quit if they got pregnant. They uh, were also required to quit if they turned 35. Um, or they could, they could face being, being fired on most airlines. Um, so, you know, over the course of the 60s and 70s, um, a lot of the women who really enjoyed their job uh, pushed back against those policies, um, whether through management or eventually in the courts. And um, thanks to the National Organization for Women and the EEOC um, legislation, they eventually into the early 70s wound up winning a lot of the lawsuits that established women's, um, the women's right to work more broadly um, for all American women. Well, and, and you even um, describe in the book how, how some, of, um, uh, some of the women would just hide the fact that they were married. They'd get married in secret so the company couldn't fire them. Totally, they, they would take their wedding rings on and off. Um, and, you know, that worked for a certain period of time, but then a couple of women, you know, they wanted to be able to extend health insurance benefits to their husbands. Um, right. and so they, uh, they wound up starting these lawsuits or, or they just wanted to be able to be married. Um, they were aware that this was right, a, and not have to hide it. Exactly. It was a total double standard. The pilots didn't have to quit when they got married. So, um, you know, it, it was, it was BS. The, the thing that that shocked me about that when I when I read all these um, you know just horribly discriminatory you know age and, and physical uh, policies is is not that they not that they happened I mean I know that they happened but you know thinking about it this isn't that long ago no it's not and and I think um, it, it's <laughs> I, I think we would like to think that uh, that it's it was further into in the past than it really is but it, it's it's not that long ago you're totally right what what happened to uh pan am because pan am's not not around anymore what what happened to pan am and then what happened to the jet age stewardess um so those are two different questions the jet age stewardess uh, really changed over the course of the, the time period that my book looks at, which is between 1966 and 1975. Um, and so over that time period, you know, in 1966, all of these rules and regulations uh, that were really sexist um, and honestly very racist as well. Um, Black women were not hired in, in 66 really. Um, and uh, so those policies began to, to fall away because they had been challenged so many times over the course of the late 60s and early 70s that eventually it became um, unprofitable for the airlines to, to keep them in place for the most part. Um, so that really changed the composition of flight crews. Um, uh, they uh, went from being white young women to being slightly more racially diverse, still not quite representative of, of the country at large, but um, but you know, more diverse, certainly. Um, and they went from being very young to much older um, and much more senior, much more experienced. Uh, and they also went from being just women to being both men and women uh, because a number of men in the early seven, late 60s and early 70s said, wait a minute, uh, this is a pretty cool job. We'd like to do it too. Thank you. Um, and they won their lawsuits as well. So um, the composition of the flight crews changed very much over the period that I'm looking at um, from the beginning of it to the end. Uh, and that has, you know, still been, that's still the case right now. The, um, 
flight crews are, are very different, but they're, they've, they've stayed much more diverse. Um, so that's, that's what happened to, to the jet age stewardess. Um, mm -hmm. She just, she changed um, and kind of grew oh. up, shall we say. <laughs> um, and then Pan Am, Pan Am, uh, once deregulation, airline deregulation happened and its protective relationship with the US government um, shifted, it, it found it much harder to keep up with and compete with other airlines. I think it's also um, my father who worked for Pan Am for, uh, oh, I don't even know how many years, a little more uh, over, I think probably about 15 years all told um, at, at its very end, uh, he would say that no airline is, is um, you know, all airlines are very hard pressed to be profitable. Um, and it, it is a really hard um, profit uh, equation uh, in, in a competitive marketplace. That's why a lot of other countries have what we call flag carriers, which is a, a, an airline that um, is connected with the government um, and is basically the only um, really big national airline, which is not the system that we have in place. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a hard, it's a really hard business to be uh, profitable in. And we're still seeing that today with the struggling airlines. Absolutely. Yeah. Never more so than today. Right. Well, um, Julia, um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, uh, your book, uh, again, Come Fly the World, uh, was so much fun to read. It's, it's very well researched. And um, if, um, you know, to use, if I may use a pun, we kind of did a flyover today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it had to come in somewhere. <laughs> the puns are really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, if someone wants to, though, uh, get a more in-depth look, look at these individual stories that you recount, uh, if they want to pick up a copy of the book uh, or learn more about you and your work, where can they go? Um, I am Julia C. Cook on Instagram and Twitter, and my website is just juliacook.com, and that's cook with an E. Uh, and uh, anything in the future we can look forward to from you? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on something. I'm working on another book, which I am too superstitious to really talk about right now. <laughs> but I also have a couple of um, short form pieces that are coming out in the next year or so that, are, that have nothing to do with Pan Am or international air travel or even, um, you know, mid-century history. Discover more shows like this one at Straight Up Strange.